Hey folks, uh, it's Nate Jones here, and uh, I'm I'm recording this uh, video on a uh, on a Tuesday night in um, I guess it's I guess it's 2023 September early September. Um, I for those of you who are new here, I threw my class at, um, at a tutorial. Um, I'll probably attach it in the comments on functions. Um, and uh, and I thought I'd go ahead and record this video because um, I wasn't there to provide an intro to those two functions to them. And uh, I was told that that was quite mean. So hopefully, uh, if you're watching this later, you find this video helpful. And uh, if you're in my class, hopefully uh, it, it smooths out some of the rough edges. Um, I, I do want to say uh, for this video, I kind of, there is an expectation that you have a basic working knowledge of R. So you can use base R and tidyverse. Um, and uh, you, you might or might not have done for loops. We're skipping for loops in my class. Um, I think, you know, for loops can be helpful and they're certainly a tool to have in the tool bag, but I'd rather my students write functions. Um, and uh, hopefully after this tutorial, you will uh, you will enjoy writing functions yourself. Um, so why, why functions? Real quick before I get started. Um, well, functions uh, I, are, are really bad at memory management. Um, it, 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 if you have a if you have an older machine uh, or even even my work computer that has or my my, my workstation uh, has like 128 gigabytes of RAM, um, you can blow that up really quick. And so what functions do is they uh, well they, they help one they're fast and then two uh, within the R environment at least they um, they do a good job of of conserving memory. Um, I'm not really sure about this. This is kind of getting beyond the edge of my knowledge. My understanding is that. Um, after the function runs, um, it spits out the output um, into the global environment. And then there's a local environment for that function and it dumps the memory from that environment. Um, and so that's why that's why it does a better job at memory management. Um, the other thing that it does really great is that when you run a function, and this will become more apparent as we walk through the um, as we walk through the, the, the exercise, you're actually going, it creates its own environment. So the variables and, and all the work that you're doing within the function are saved within the functions environment. Um, and that's really important. Um, and it helps, one, it, it helps manage the global environment that you're using within your, your uh, R session. Um, and then two, it's um, it, 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 when you have issues arise or you want to run a repetitive process um, hundreds or thousands of times, um, it keeps uh, it keeps that environment clean, um, and it also, if there's an error, it doesn't corrupt the rest of of, of your environment, right? So, um, as an example, uh, today we will uh, we'll work on using USGS Stream Gauge, uh, the USGS Stream Gauge network in Alabama, um, and we'll we'll do some calculations. We'll actually the homework uh, for the students in the class is to calculate maximum stream flow from across the USGS Stream Gauges in Alabama, and so um, they could run this calculation for each individual gauge. Um, and it would probably take tens of thousands of lines of code and really just be a lot of copy and pasting. However, uh, we can write a function um, and then we can apply that function to a list of the gauge IDs. And all of a sudden in under a hundred lines of code, um, we can we can get the output of, of those calculations. Um, so it's a very efficient way uh, to, to do a lot of re repetitive tasks or to do a large amount of repetitive tasks quickly. Um, now, as this is this is kind of um, you know moving into the intermediate coding or scripting um, um, area, and so um, you know for for my class, there's some folks in the class that are relatively new to R, and this is going to be a big jump, and that's okay. Um, and you you know um, my goal for you today is just to understand to be able to read functions, um, and then. Um, you'll see in the assignment, it'll be pretty easy uh, to uh, just copy and paste what, what the code I've given you and alter that a little bit and then rerun it, and you'll actually be able to complete the assignment. Um, I might even, you know, we'll see how we go, how it goes in this tutorial, but I might even provide that at the end. Um, and yeah, so uh, uh, without further ado, it's been since COVID, since I've uh, done one of these online tutorials. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, hopefully it goes well. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully you guys learn something. And, and as always, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just, I'm gonna set up a whiteboard if I can find my mouse over here. Uh-oh. So 
So it's loading a whiteboard. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, I'm just going to like do some semi code and write out what a function looks like. Um, and um, if I can get my, my mouse to work over here, here we go. Uh, presenting. Okay. So let's go ahead and create this whiteboard and we'll go from there. Uh oh, my computer's about to run out of battery. Hopefully that keeps us at bay. All right. So what's the anatomy of a function? Well, first, um, we had we, we have the function call, right? So it's a function itself. So the function function um, might play the conjunction junction. What's your function? Um, but so the first thing is we have is the function call. And so that's just call function, right? This. So then we have the variables within that function that we're going to use. So you put a open parentheses, and then in this example, I'm going to use X and Y. You can put as many variables as you want. The important point here, though, is that you separate them by a comma. So X, Y. And then uh, we can name this function. Oftentimes, I'll name this uh, I'll name this something descriptive, like gauge function, or just fun, um, you know, whatever you want. So for today, we'll just call them fun because they're super fun. So again, we're just naming this function fun. And then we make that equal to the function. And now we have to build the body of the function, right? So we can use the squiggly brackets, our favorite brackets. And we put the work that we're going to do in that function. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, Z. I'm going to say Z equals X plus Y. So that's the work of the function, right? This is the body of the function. And in this case, I'm just going to add X and Y together, something really simple. Now, these functions, like I've written functions that are 10,000 lines long. Um, so you can add a lot of information in here. Um, so, you know, that really the, the world is your oyster. But for today, I'm just going to simply add X and Y. Um, and I'm going to call this Z, right? So I'm defining the Z variable within the function environment. So this isn't, when you run the function, Z is not actually, you're not going to get a variable in your global environment, the environment that you're used to working in. You're not going to get Z to show up. What's going to happen is you're going to need to print that out. So what I often do is just the variable that I want to print out. That's the last line in my function. So in this case, it's Z. Then I'll close my squiggly, squiggly marks. And that's my function. Now, if I wanted to apply this function, I'd simply say fun. X equals, let's say, let's say five. Right? And y equals, I don't know, six. When I've run this, um, it's going to return, r is going to return 11, right? Because we're saying five plus six is 11. So let's say I put this into my console and I run it, this would be 11. Now, importantly, if I wanted to save this output, right, I would need to name that. So let's say, let's call this output. I often call my function outputs output. Real creative, I know. So output equals fun. And you know, I don't necessarily need to say x equals five, y equals six. Um, if if it's written x comma y, I can just say I can just put insert the variables I want there um, for shorthand. So five six, what this would do is it would save output. You, the output variable would now be equal to 11. So you could say output and 11 would show up in your console. So um, let's, let's go ahead and throw that into R just to see what it kind of looks like. So uh, this, is, this is my script and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be real uh, fast about this. So, uh, 
we said we created a function. We're going to call it fun. Call the function call. I'm going to say we're going to define the x and y variable. I'm going to open the brackets. And remember, we said z equals x plus y. And then we're going to print z, right? So I'm going to go ahead and run this. I'll send it to my console. That's what I did there. And now I'm going to prep, I'm going to say fun equals five comma six, get eleven. Then if I name that output five comma six, that saves into my global environment. And voila, when I print output, it's eleven. Um, and so again, um, in the tutorial, there's a longer article that I provided on how to write functions. Um, I expect everyone to go through that and read that. Um, it's going to do a much uh, better job of, of uh, describing what functions are um, and then the basic uses of functions than I did there. Um, however, this was a quick primer. So what I want to do with the rest of our time today is I want to walk you through an example of how I often um, how I often analyze stream flow data. Um, for a lot of us in the in the, the Center for Freshwater Studies, we think about how flow regimes or variability in stream flow impacts ecology. And so uh, a, a big part of what I do for teams is I actually look at um, flow regimes and how they um, how they impact. Oh, Lord, I wasn't sharing my screen. That's real sad. Hopefully I can edit this bad boy. Share my screen. Uh oh. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Hopefully, I can edit the last last five minutes. But uh, to to show you what I did, I created a function, uh, just like we wrote in the semicode, and then um, I applied that function. All right. So I'm going to save it. I'm going to go ahead and send the function to my console. And I'm going to run it, right? It's 11, just like we saw. And I'm going to save that. I'm going to say, I'm going to say output equals fun five, six. I'll run that. And I'm going to go ahead and print output. And as you can see there, right, when I look at output, it's 11. And so, um, yeah, just like we did in the semicode, um, you'll, you can see it there. Um, so um, sorry guys, I, I, I didn't show my, I didn't, wasn't sharing my screen before. That's real unfortunate. Um, so hopefully uh, hopefully that makes more sense. Now, moving on um, to, moving on to today's lecture um, or today's example, like I was saying, uh, we um, here in the Center for Freshwater Studies, we often think about how flow regimes impact different components of ecology, everything from biogeochemistry, biogeochemical signatures and water quality uh, to, to habitat, like muscle habitat. Dr. Atkinson's lab thinks a lot about muscle habitat. Um, and so today we're going to, I'm going to show you how I, um, how I do this analysis for gauges um, and then, um, you know, set you free so you can do it, do a little bit of this for your homework. Okay, so just like always, I go ahead and write my header file. I would encourage everyone to do this. Um, so the title, and let's go lab three functions. Uh, then we move on to coder. That's me, Nick Jones. I often put my email address in here because um, people, you know, they can contact me if they need to. Um, put the date, it's 9 12, 2023. And then uh, you guys are too probably too young to remember Y2K, but don't put 23, put 2023. Um, anyway, purpose um, demo functions. Again, it's just good good practice to put these put these header files. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to develop my workflow, right? And so what I want to do is I want to calculate. Um, I want to calculate. Uh, average, what am I going to do? Yeah, average annual stream flow for every year um, in the, the gauge record. And I'm actually going to do this um, for where run, we're looking at runoff depth, so stream flow in inches per year. And so the first thing I need to do is I need to identify a gauge of interest, right? And so um, first gauge, the gauge that I always love. 
Let's go ahead and say, so first thing we actually, the first thing we need to do is set up our, our work environment. So uh, step one, step work environment. So, so let's let's go ahead and clear our environment. So we use remove equals list um, equals ls. We did this last week. That shouldn't be anything new. We want to go ahead and load our libraries, right? Uh, so let's load libraries of interest. And I'd encourage you guys to comment, just like I'm commenting here, because this is all really important. And remember, you're always co collaborating with uh, at least two people, uh, you and future you. And let me tell you, past me or future me often hates me now, especially when I don't comment my code well. Okay, so today we're gonna need the data retrieval library, just like we did last week. Uh, similarly, we need the tidyverse library because we're part of the cult. Then we need the lubridate library, all right? Um, and then let's go ahead and define, well, that, that's good for now. So, yeah. All right, so step to create workflow. So we're gonna, we wanna apply that, we wanna estimate annual, um, annual average stream flow in inches per year for the entire, uh, for, for multiple gauges, right? And so um, we can do this, uh, we can do this several ways. But the first thing we want to do, right, is do it for one, one gauge. And so, uh, we're just like uh, like always, we're going to use the SIPC, uh, the SIPC gauge near uh, near L rod, which is just outside of campus. Um, so let's let's go ahead and define that, right? So this is our gauge, and let's download the stream flow data, right? Um, and so again. We've done all this before. So uh, download stream flow data. So call it DF and then read NWIS because I'm pulling this from the NWIS database. Daily value, site numbers, equals age, and then parameter code equals zero, 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 six, zero, right? So uh, we're gonna down, so this function to pull it, you, again, you have to be connected to the internet, uh, but that loads the data frame. Um, and so what we'll wanna do first is we wanna tidy this, this messy data frame they give us. So let's go tidy data. And so, um, what I'm going to do first is just go ahead and start our pipeline. So DF pipe, and then I'm going to turn this into a tibble, right? That's my first part of the pipeline. Oh, that didn't work. I forgot the E. Oh, all right. So now we're in a tibble. So everything, all is good with the world, right? Because tibbles are a little bit tidier. I'm just hit control L to clean my console because I like a clean console. Um, and Whoa, whoops. So I'm gonna go ahead and run that again. And what I wanna do is I wanna I wanna pull out the date column and I wanna pull out the flow column. So to do that, I'm gonna use the uh, select function and I'm going to let's say date equals to date. Note that that's already in date format, which is real handy. And then I'm gonna say, Q CFS because that's uh, this is flow big cube um, and it's in the cubic feet per second and I just know that because I'm used to using uh, USGS stream flow data. I'm gonna go ahead and name it uh, what this column is right. So all I've done here is I've made my table. Um, when I run this, I'm printing it. Remember, I'm not saving it yet. Um, when I run this pipeline, I'm just reducing the data to both the date and the flow. Um, and so since we're already in date format, we're good to go. However, maybe we don't trust that it's in the date format. Maybe if we're doing this for over 200 gauges, which we're about to do, maybe it would be good to go ahead and define that as, uh, as the date format. And so what I'm going to do is I'm using the mutate function. 
to change date, but I'm going to say date equals year, month, day, date. And so again, this is just the Lubridate package, and I'm just making sure that this is in the correct Lubridate date format. We talked about this all last week. So this none of this should look really new. Um, the next thing I'm going to do, so I'm going to save that for now. The next thing I want to do is I want to download watershed area. Now, I, because we want to go from CFS to inches per day or inches per year, um, we we need to, what we'll do is divide watershed area or we'll divide flow by watershed area and that will get us from volume per time to depth per time. And this is, these are these are weird units, but they it's often the units that we work in as hydrologists. So download watershed area, note, I know that because I'm working in um, I'm working with uh, with, with USGS, it's going to come back in miles squared. So I'm going to use read use inwiz uh, site. So this is another uh, data retrieval function. And if you wanted to learn more about this, you could just put a question mark in front of it and run that, and it would tell you all about the function here and about the input and output. But since uh, I already know that, I'm going to say site numbers, gauge. I'm going to select drainage area VA, because that's the drainage area. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run that. Right, so that's it gives me a tibble, the drainage area. And then I'm going to use this pool function. And it, what it's going to turn it into is just a vector or a single value. So see, instead of being a tibble like it was before, it's a single value. So I'm going to go ahead and name this pipeline, watershed area. Go ahead and do this. And now I'm simply going to, um, I'm going to calculate daily runoff depth. So um, here we go. So daily runoff depth, calc. And so what, all we need to do is call df again, use the mutate function. And let's go ahead and call this q, small q, because it's, it's area weighted, inches per day. And then what we're going to do is simply divide CFS uh, flow, the daily flow value, by the watershed area. Now, of course, we need to do unit conversions to make to turn this into inches per day uh, to go from CFS to inches per day. And uh, I'm not going to walk you guys through those because y'all are grad students, and um, you can uh, do um, y'all can all do math. Um, so I, I trust that you can do those. And if you can't come see me, I'm happy to talk you through this math. And so when we run that, we get Q inches per day. And then I want to go ahead and to get this to inches per year. Um, well, to get to, to inches per day, but average by year, I want to go ahead. Ah, that didn't work out. I want to go ahead and um, use the group by and summarize uh, functions. So I'll go ahead and do another mutate and say year equals year date, right? So we're just trying to calculate year. So we have year now calculated and we can go from there, um, we can group by year and then summarize and then Q inches equals sum Q inch Per day, it may not remove equals true because you might have some uh, some days that were that there, there was there's negative nine nine value negative nine 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 value or an NA. Um, then also I want to count the number of days in each year, and so I'll do this using the in open and close parentheses the count function, right? So I'll do that. Let's go ahead and run that. 
And so uh, this is pretty cool. You see that I get I get the the average or the the average daily flow or the I guess the the inches per year, right? So I summed it, right? So I get the, the inches um, per year and then the number of days that were counted. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and filter to uh, years with at least 350 um, 50 days of flow or 350 flow measurements. So n is greater than 350. And so uh, what you see is that um, runoff, which is again, this is a, a thing that we annual runoff, so inches per year. Um, it ranges at least for the first 10 years, anywhere from 25 to 30 inches per year. Now, if you think about that, right, we typically get 55 inches of rain per year. And so, you know, almost half of that is coming out of stream flow in this watershed, which is pretty cool when you start to think about water balance. Um, and now uh, we can we can also go ahead if we wanted to clean up our data frame and move the the end columns and just you select and then subtract that column out using the select function. Um, and if we really wanted to, then we can calculate the mean um, annual runoff. And so um, instead of using a group by function, group by and summarize, we could just use summarize. So we're you summarize and then Q inches equals mean Q inches. And so that gives me the export, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and save this. Save, this is my data frame. And then I'm gonna, so I'm gonna interrogate this data frame. Perfect. Now, um, if I was gonna do this a bunch of times, I would want a data frame or a tibble with both the gauge ID and um, and the output or the value I'm trying to calculate, um, that way I could keep up with it, right? You just don't want a floating value without some unique identifier. And that's really important when you're writing functions is you always want to pair your output and you want to have a unique identifier so it can find its home. Um, and so what I did here, or what I can do here is uh, output. And so I use the mutate function and remember I have this this variable gauge. So I'm gonna say gauge equals gauge, right? Oh nope. I spell it right. And all of a sudden I have um I, I have a gauge that unique identifier added there as well as well as the what we were looking to calculate. So I'm gonna go ahead and name this and run it. Aha. All right. So this is our workflow. Right. And so I can hit control A, run the entire script just to see what it does. And voila. Um, I calculated the average annual runoff of the Sipsi River is 21.3 inches. That's pretty cool, especially since we have 70 years of flow data. Be pretty straightforward to then go calculate uh, rainfall from. Um, rainfall from the airport um, and then you know uh, look at that the, the 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 ratio of runoff to rainfall um, and it'd be probably somewhere between 30 and 50 percent which is pretty cool ha. but I digress um, so to, to to write a function we can now now that we've written this this workflow we can write a function that includes this workflow um, with the variable gauge and then we can add any gauge we want in and it'll spit it out for us so I'm gonna go ahead and say step three, write function, conjunction, junction, what's your function? Write function. All right, so let's go. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to name our function. We're gonna call it fun because it's so much fun. We're gonna call the function. Um, uh, the, the the function function right, and then we're gonna put our variable gauge in. Then open up brackets, and this is the beauty of why functions are so great. I'm gonna grab all of this information except the definition of the gauge. I'm gonna copy 
we're going to paste it in, right? And so that's our function. And then what we're going to do is one step left. We have to print the output. So the very last line of the function is what you print. And so we're going to say print output, and we're just going to say dia. So it's going to print that output. It's going to print it from the, the, the local functional environment. It's going to go away after you run it to the global environment. So let's go ahead and run that function. And let's, uh, let's go grab the Sipsy gauge. I should know that by heart now. So S function. Boom. It's quite easy, right? So we took that workflow. We, we, we created a workflow. We did it for one gauge. And then we, we took all that data. We just copy and pasted it into the function, right? Into the brackets, the body of that function. Um, and then we ran it. And all of a sudden, we've got our own function that calculates mean um, mean runoff in inches per, um, inches per year, right? Across the gauge's record. This is awesome. All right, so you might ask, all right, Nate, well, how do I how do I run this for 200 gauges? Do I need to print function the gauge and then copy and paste that 200 times and insert individual gauges? You could do that, but that would be silly because we can use um, we can use a combination of L apply and bind rows um, to to go ahead and apply that function. I'll show you how to do that. Three, step, four, four. Apply that function. Bam, bam, bam. All right, this is about to get real exciting, y'all. Okay, so what I want to do is from the tutorial, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab a series of gauges. Right? Boom. And so what I'm going to do hold on one second. All right, guys, I'm back. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to go ahead and create a function, a wrapper function, that essentially rotates through each one of these gauge numbers and applies it to the function. Um, so let's uh, let's go ahead and share my screen. Bada bing, bada boom. And then I'm going to go uh, back to my wrapper function. So I'm going to put my function within a function, which is really common. Um, it's just, just like shells of an onion, so to speak. So let's go ahead and find gauges interest and then let's create a wrapper function so wrapper function so i'm going to name the function the wrapper function because it wraps around my original function call it function and then uh my my variables in i could call this anything but i like in because i'm actually using it as a counter right and if you've ever written a loop a for loop, it's just like a, a counter and a for loop. And so then I'm going to open my brackets, I'm going to apply my function, and then I'm going to do it to the nth gauge, right? So I'm going to go ahead and define this, right? Um, I want to come back to what this means in just a second. So wrapper function, now I'm just going to say an integer one that's, um... oh no, it didn't work. Let me see if it works for two. Ah, must be something wrong with that gauge. I'm going to delete that for now. I know what's wrong with that. So let's go ahead and redefine my gauges. And let's, let's do wrapper function one. Boom. All right. So what I'm going to do. Um, and this is this is uh, quite important. I'm going to use the lapply function to uh, 
to estimate so to create a list of these outputs. Um, and if you don't know what a list data type is, pause right here and Google list um, data types and all. Okay, so let's go. Um, so let's go ahead and apply. So I like the LLY because it returns a list and that's quite a flexible format. You could also use ethapply. That, that's also quite a flexible format um, that could be that can be applied to. So L apply X. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna use the sequence functions one through length gauges. So all that sequence is doing is it's returning a vector of the of the counters. So one, two, three, that we're going to input into the function. And then we're going to use a function. And this is going to be the wrapper function. Right? So let's go ahead and do this. So I, I'm running the L apply. And it's, it's a going to run um, all three of these functions. And what you end up getting is a list, right? So you get uh, a list of tibbles, right? So each object in the list is its own individual tibble. Um, and you're like, okay, great, Nate, but I'd really like this in column form. And so that's that's how we use this bind rows. So I'm gonna go ahead and name this output, run it, and I'm going to bind rows, let that finish running, okay, output, Okay, so I used output and bind rows. I'm gonna go ahead and run this. I'm gonna print this. Just to see what it looks like. And oh my gosh, we've got a usable tipple. We've got the gauge number and we've got the annual, the average annual stream flow. All right, great. So you could stop here. But what happens if if it doesn't work, right? Like what happens if there's an error? And, and there could be errors for lots of reasons, a lot of reasons outside of your control. Like maybe that gauge is no longer listed in, in, in widths, right? Um, maybe I gave you a bad list of gauges on purpose. I don't know. I, I Yeah. So uh, we can use error handling. This is really important. So instead of using this wrapper function, I want to use this error, I use an error handling function. Let's go ahead and, boy, error handling. And so I'm going to go ahead and create a new function. I'm going to call this the error function. Create error function. And again, this is a wrapper function. So it's going to have, it's going to be a function that goes on the outside of my original function. Um, and so let's call this error fun because errors are fun name it function. Again, we're going to use that in because we're going to run through a sequence of integers, one, two, three, four, five, which are going to point to specific, they're going to point to specific gauge numbers in our vector. And then we're going to use try catch. So what try catch does is it runs the function of interest. And then if there's an error, it spits out a specific error. It, it spits that error out. So uh, we'll give it the expression. It's fun. I'm going to say gauges in. And again, that gauges in is just calling gauges is a vector. I'm going to go ahead and print gauges for you guys. See, gauges just keep a vector of gauge numbers that we've defined. And then when we say in, in this case, it'd be one, two, or three. And if we say gauges three, that points to the third, the third gauge ID in that vector. So that's our expression. Then if we have an error, we create an error function, function E, and we say tibble. And in this case, we give it the output that we would print from that function. So Q N equals N A, and then gauge equals gauges N. And so um, that's our error function. So let's go ahead and run that. And so we can test it now, right? So error on one. 
hey, it works. But let's say we put in a, a number 10, right? So we only have three, three uh, places in our vector, but say we put 10, it's obviously not going to work. And so what that does is it returns an error for us and then it tells us um, that's an error. And so what that allows us to do is when we use L apply, um, it, one error doesn't stop the entire process. There's nothing worse than running a list like 200 processes or thousands, hundreds of thousands of processes and having one error kill your entire like two or three hour run. So um, again, what we can do is we can um, can use this same L apply approach. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy it from above. Where we have output, and instead of using the wrapper function, we're just gonna use the error function, right? So coding is a lot of copying and pasting. Output. Let it do its thing. It's gonna take a second. Um, and then we can use bind rows, we'll print that, bada bing, bada boom, it works. Now, the next step is really fun. What we can do is we can apply, we can use this, uh, but increase our gauge numbers, right? And so um, I'm gonna do this without parallel because, well, uh, I think that that'd be a bit much for some of us, but, um, I'm going to go ahead and apply this error function to a watch list. So I'm going to define, uh, you know, the first set of gauges um, in the, from the tutorial, go ahead and do that. And then I'm going to rerun this output function, right? So on the gauges, I've got a new list of gauges. I'm gonna apply, apply the same function as before. And it's gonna take a second. It's probably gonna take a couple minutes, in fact. Um, so I'm gonna pause it. I'll come back to you guys when we're done. Okay, that took like two minutes, um, which is fine. So I went and refilled my glass and uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen again. All right, and so I'm gonna go ahead and bind those rows and look at my output. And now check this out. I've got a couple of NAs. And uh, so um, in, I think in the tutorial, I actually, instead of defining them as NA, I defined them as negative 999. Um, regardless, uh, these are where errors occurred. And I don't know why these errors occurred, but they did. Um, and it's good to know that they're there. Um, and if, if we're doing a publication, we would chase those errors. I suspect watershed area, um, it was not provided for these gauges. Um, regardless, that's okay. We're just gonna go ahead and plot the data we have. And that's all I want you guys to do. So let's plot for funsies. And so, Go ahead and call our output. And let's, let's filter for QN greater than zero. And so uh, for if you have, if you didn't put NAs in and you used negative 999, like we did in the, the, the um, in the, in, I, I showed in the, the um, tutorial, that will work, but you could also, Simply, uh, if you use the NA, you could say output, um, well, NA omit. I think, no, it's not NA omit. Give me a second. NA, I think it's drop NA. Yeah, there we go. Drop NA. So we run that. You end up removing all the NAs. Um, so that's what we'll do. But again, you could do filter anything greater than zero if you use negative 999. These are just decisions you have to make. ggplot. In this case, look, we're since this is a univariate 
uh, distribution, we just want to define x, and x equals q in. Um, and in this case, again, I want to use a density plot. I like density plots. Uh, you could use a histogram just as easily. Um, just any plot to display the univariate distribution. So genome density. Uh, and uh, we've already defined our aesthetic. And in this, I need to define my kernel. So this is just a smoothing technique. And this is Gaussian. And, you know, well, I want to feel fancy today. So use the black white theme. I think that, that's my favorite. And then um, the other things that I normally do is I go ahead and I control my axis title um, element text size equals 12 point font. Um, maybe we go 14, I don't know. However you're feeling that day, title equals element text size for the, uh, not, well, access title and we move access dot text element text size is 10. I hope I did that right. Um, close the brackets and then I'm going to go ahead and change my X label to stream flow in inches per year. Let's plot this bad boy. Oh, something went wrong. Well, we're wrong here. Axis text. Oh, I forgot. I forgot my comma. It's always something little like that. Nope, something went wrong. Oh, I used the pipe operator instead of the plus operator. Let's see if this works now. Oh, I'm going to tidy this. Okay. Boom. All right. So there's our there's our distributional plot. And uh, there we go. Now, let's say I wanted to do this. Uh, I wanted to get, instead of mean, I wanted to get max annual flow. Well, that would be pretty easy. Because all I would have to do is maybe save this. And I could copy and paste. The whole the whole document or just save it save as and save it as a different document and then I could go in and say Q right here in the um, in the function right within my function go ahead and, and instead of saying uh, Q inches equals mean all I would have to do is change that to max and then you know hit control a run that bad boy. And in two or three minutes, we should have a uh, we should have a new plot. I'm gonna go ahead and pause while it does its thing, and we're back. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Bada bing, bada boom, and ha. Um, very simply, um, I've created this new plot. And so we get uh, max stream, uh, max annual stream flow. Um, uh, we get, you know, anywhere from uh, 30 to 50 uh, inches per year, which is pretty cool. Oh, I wasn't sharing again. All right, did that, boom, right there. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and so I can't remember exactly what I asked you to do in the assignment, uh, but this this should be a good start in that direction. And honestly, if you turned in something like this, I'd be pretty stoked. Um, the other thing I didn't show you how to do is parallel processing. Um, feel free to simply copy and paste that code, right? Um, so for the folks who are a little bit more advanced, please dissect that. Um, and I, I, yeah, definitely walk through that. But for the rest of you, feel free to copy and paste it or don't. You can also just run the code for this and it'll take 10 minutes to run. And that's no big deal, 10 minutes. Uh, to run a large process is pretty normal. Um, and so today, again, uh, you guys, we, we learned how to write a function. Uh, we learned how to apply that function. Um, and then, uh, I, you know, showed you some hint, some tips and tricks on that, on how to apply those functions. And so what I want to end with quickly here 
is I want to, um, I can pull it back up. I'm gonna look at these best man management practices uh, for creating functions. So the first one is to keep, um, I hope you guys can still see my screen, but uh, the first one is to keep your global environment and your functions environment completely separate. Um, you don't want to change variables in your global environment from within your functional environment. You want to ship all the variables that you need into your function, excuse me, and then edit those variables within your function and then print the output. Um, that's by far the best and cleanest way to use functions. Um, and um, I, I, I cannot tell you enough how many times um, I've, I've cheated and I've started to edit things within my within my uh, global environment from my functional environment and life just falls apart. Don't do it. Um, one thing that's really helpful, um, especially as you start to run processes in parallel, load your package, packages within your function. Uh, my buddy Adam um, Price does this uh, and um, it's, it saves a lot of headache later on, especially when you're running things in parallel. <laughs> use a counter as your variable, right? So write an initial function and then use a counter to walk through a list of things that you're applying to that function. Um, export your, your results as a single row, right? If a tibble, and in that row, you should have a unique ID. And then finally, um, this error funk, this error handling approach uh, will save you a lot of time and heartache. Um, so again, um, I hope you enjoyed this, this tutorial. Um, I uh, certainly certainly enjoyed writing it and, and, and uh, delivering it to you guys. And I hope um, I hope this this helps you um, you know walk through functions, and I, I hope this is like the start of a great adventure in R. Um, I certainly have used this a lot. Like I said, um, in the last like five or six years, I've published a handful of really high impact papers where we looked where we quantified flow regimes, and we did this by using this same exact approach. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hope this helps. Um, and please uh, reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns. Um, and with that, thank you and roll tide.